All right. Thank you all for tuning in to this first event. Uh, welcome to After the Dragon, Asia's Africa's in New York City. My name is Maya Singal, and I'm a doctoral candidate in the arch uh, sorry, in the anthropology department at Harvard um, with Veronica Peterson, Rowan Flad, and Michael Hewitt. I conceived the series loosely around my dissertation research, which deals with African-American and Chinese-American mutual aid, crime, and criminalization in New York City. Um, you might notice that these events aren't being held at Harvard, and that's because I wanted to bring you all to my field site with me. As anthropologists, we often talk about community engagement and public anthropology, and this series is partly an experiment in demonstrating ethnographic methods to the public. Most of these events will take place at different locations around New York, and if you're in the city, please join us in person on October 3rd at Beer, Wa Beer Wax, Brooklyn, a Black-owned vinyl record uh, and craft beer bar, for a conversation about Black revolutionaries, hip-hop artists, and Black culture in China. If you can't make it to New York, all of our events will be live streamed and posted to YouTube um, through the Asia Center. Many of our speakers are people I've met through my field work, chefs, musicians, martial artists, and fashion designers, and junior scholars that I've met during my time at Harvard. I wanted to bring these people together here in my field site in New York to have more localized, grounded, ethnographic conversations about Black and Asian cultures, histories, and solidarities topics that we all explore in our own work in quite different ways. We're extremely grateful to Harvard's Asia Center, the Anthropology Department, and the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies for their support of the series. Thank you especially to Tenzin Ngoda, uh, Julie Story, Chris Paul, and Mike Holmes for their invaluable logistical help. Thanks to Bohan Lang for his help with putting the series together. Uh, Winton Wong and Brett Ryoji Kodama are our incredible live stream staff. Uh, Tinghua Shaw made our poster inspired by the classic black martial arts film, The Last Dragon. Unfortunately, one of our speakers, Zoe Gong, is stuck in Bosnia right now, so she couldn't be here. Um, Zoe is a traditional Chinese medicine chef and nutritionist. You can find her work on her Instagram, which is linked on our event page on the Asia Center's website. Our chef today is Sean Liu, the founder and culinary director of My Sweet Grandma or MSG Kitchen a food venture focused on changing the way we think about and approach food through discussing history and culture, sharing recipes, and feeding hungry souls. Sean is joined by Veronica Peterson, a doctoral candidate in archaeology at Harvard. Her dissertation research investigates the relationship between home cooking and community identities in the Chinese diaspora in Northern California. As part of this event, we also pre-circulated Sean's recipe for chili crisp inspired by Sunset Park, which you can cook at home. The link is at the bottom of the page for this event on the Asia Center website. Um, so we wanted to start by having Sean talk us through the recipe. Yeah, hey, I'm Sean, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, that chili crisp recipe that hopefully you all took a look at, if not, um, like Maya said, it's, it's at the bottom. Um, is a really special one. We use uh, all local ingredients here in Sunset Park in Brooklyn, uh, which is where I live currently. Um, so all local Mexican chilies that I get literally two blocks down uh, from my house, um, Chinese ingredients that I get from the bodega, uh, the Chinese bodega like across the street. Um, and it's all just cooked here. Uh, it's one of the best chili crisps that I enjoyed eating. Um, one of the most aromatic, also one of the most flavorful that I find, and it's all really thanks to the Mexican chilies that we use. So it's a blend of six different chilies, um, chili de arbol, guajillo, pasilla, uh, chili chipotle, mulatto, and ancho. Uh, and that's what we have right here. So this is our chili crust. Um, it's made with a bunch of different goodies, but really it's really a, a homage to the immigrant history of Sunset Park. You know, Sunset Park, um, its first settlers were the Canarsie uh, Native in, uh, Indians here. Then the Dutch came in, um, followed by the Irish after the potato famine, the Norwegians, the Poles, uh, the Finns. Uh, then, then finally, I think the Puerto Ricans, other Latin Americans and Chinese came in. So Sunset Park has this incredible history just like immigrants. Um, that really define and shape the makeup of the of the community here. Um, and right now it's like predominantly um, Hispanic, mainly Puerto Rican, Mexican, Dominican, um, and Chinese. I think it's like actually the largest 
it, it actually overseeded the Nahan Chinatown to like the largest Chinese population in, uh, especially in Brooklyn, but in, in New York, there's a whole other region. Uh, but yeah, that's, that, that's the chili crisp. Um, I hope you enjoy it. If you can find uh, those chilies, they're all, they're all, uh, the recipes down below, but you can probably get them all online, to be honest. You or can, maybe, or maybe look into the chilies that are available in the place where you live. Exactly. And adapt the recipe that way. That's also true. Yeah. Uh, you might not get as floral of notes, but there are definitely ways to do it. Uh, on, on the bottom of that recipe, there's like little tasting notes and like flavor notes. Because uh, I don't believe in like measurements. I don't cook with measurements. So instead, I, I like to say, hey, just have an idea of what you want your end product to be, what you want it to taste like, what you want it to smell like, and like go through that. Figure out like what the components are and like make it such that like it, it comes out the end product that, that you want. Amazing. Um, I think that goes really well into our next question, which is for both Veronica and Sean, uh, how did you start cooking? Who taught you? How did you learn to cook? What brought you in? to be interested in cooking. Oh, sure. I mean, I'll go first, I think, because I won't be displaying any cooking <laughs> prowess. Um, but actually, uh, the reason I got interested and started cooking in the first place was when I you know, left home for college, I was suddenly missing, like most people, all of my mom's cooking. And so it started getting me to question both like, you know, why, why am I so homesick? And it, why is the way the homesickness like coming through through like through these food longings that I'm having. Uh, so then I, you know, called my mom up for the recipe for her like soy sauce, soy sauce soup noodles. And I would make it, you know, in our college dormitory kitchen. Um, and that just sort of sparked this uh, long-term uh, fascination. Like that's basically how I started to learn to cook was by asking my mom. And then I really got into learning like through cookbooks but it wasn't the same as having someone like walk me through the actual recipe and show me, you know, well, when I was a kid, she would have me, like, I became the, the person who cut the cucumbers for cucumber salad. You know, there was like very tasks that I had. So I always had these like weird isolated bits of knowledge about how you cooked, but it wasn't until I started asking questions that I could actually sort of put, to, put it together into a, into a practice that I could use to feed myself and others. So. Um. I grew up in restaurants. So my parents had Chinese restaurants uh, when they were here and I grew up in those. Um, I always tell the story, I've been, been in a restaurant for as long as um, I could safely stand on a bar stool and scoop rice into the Chinese dinner containers. Um, but actually I didn't cook much at home. Um, I wasn't really allowed in the kitchen. My parents didn't like me going in, but I learned from watching. Um, my grandma predominantly raised me as a kid and my parents were, were working a lot. Um, so when I wasn't at the restaurant, I would eat at grandma's house and just like washing her cook, kind of, um, absorbing the knowledge from there and also absorbing the knowledge from the, the kitchens in the restaurant is how I got my start. Um, but can I jump in with yeah, a question? Was your grandmother like, what's the, what was the immigration history? Yeah. So my, um, my grandfather was the first to come here. Um, I believe in the sixties, um, he came he came from Fuzhou, um, which is where we're from, my family's from, um, that area. And he came on a boat. Uh, originally, um, he was like, he, he kind of snuck his way into America. He was like working on this boat as like a, like a ship help, uh, shipping, uh, ship hand. And then um, first he went to Canada and then made his way over to the States, um, set up shop in um, actually like Sheepshead Bay, I think, in, um, in New York and uh, first started working in like American restaurants and then just opened up his own like Chinese restaurant. Um, then he later brought in over his wife and his kids. Um, so he had four kids at the time. Uh, the eldest stayed back in China because she was already married. Uh, but then the youngest, including my father, um, who was the youngest of the, of the four, they all came in around like the age they were in high school. So they started high school here in, in New York, but they, none of them finished high school. Um, but yeah, that's, that's basically how they all came in here. Uh, and then my parents met uh, later on um, through family, and they got married pretty early. Had me, oh, had my older sister that had me. Mm -hmm. and so it was over from there. Yeah. Now they have a little, another little one. But um, yeah, the but yeah, I, I I've been I basically just been absorbing food knowledge since since then. And I started cooking cooking in like home ec middle school actually. Uh, like the first thing I learned was like like Alfredo sauce, um, <laughs> and then I would find myself in the kitchens uh, back when my parents, my parents actually closed their Chinese takeout restaurants 
and opened Japanese restaurants when like the wave was to like go to Japanese food instead of mm-hmm. Chinese food. Um, and I was cooking more there, um, worked basically every position like the sushi, like tempura, grilling, etc. cetera. Um, but it was funny because my parents never ate like food that I made because they always like, oh my God, it's so gross. Like, don't, don't eat this, whatever. Um, but yeah, ever since then, I just, yeah, I just developed a love for it. And then cooking and food was really just like my only interest. And then how I came to understand like a lot of other parts of the world. Mm-hmm. Maya, do you want to talk a little bit about like your experience with home cooking? I mean, I like, <laughs> like, do you do like, do you, do you do it? Do you enjoy it? Or do you not? Like, I feel like that's an, an important thing about home yeah. cooking is that it's not a, like you have to eat, right? But you don't have to enjoy cooking. I love cooking for other people. And I think that that's something that in my family was very, like, it was very much a part of, like, how we, you know, spend time with each other, how we relate to each other. Um, I've been trying to learn more about, like, sort of my cooking heritages, I guess, mm-hmm. Chinese food, Indian food. Um, but even like my Chinese grandmother, like she only learned to cook when she came to the U.S. Um, so there's not a lot of that sense of like ancestral recipes or things like that. I think, um, I learned a lot of how to cook from the internet, (laughs) everyone else, TikTok. Um, yeah, TikTok has weirdly gotten me very much more into cooking than I ever was. That's so interesting. That's incredible, Um, honestly. (laughs) It's like a 60 second cooking show. Um, speaking of 60 second cooking shows, um, I think that, oh, I will also say for the audience, um, we'll do Q&A at the end. So if you have questions or anything like that, um, you can put them in the Q&A chat. Hopefully that's open. Um, cool. So on to the cooking part of this. Um, do you want to talk us through what's in these bowls? Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to make some good old bowls today um, with uh, braised beef. Um, this beef that I have going here, we know we already started this, uh, process earlier today, or, or last night. but this beef is basically cooked. It's, uh, marinated and basically like, like a now braise almost, or like a Chinese soy braise. Um, it's for us or for my family, we did a really simple one that was just, uh, soy sauce, Fujinese cooking wine, um, which for us is very important. Fujinese cooking wine. Uh, we use Fujinese cooking wine as opposed to like Shaoxing wine um Fujinese people are very particular about their like their cooking wine and their wine in general um so true to true to my culture I use solely Fujinese cooking wine um sugar and then a bunch of spices five spice powder but also whole spices here um we have a whole mixture of them it's cinnamon clove star anise um coriander green cardamom black cardamom you have red uh Szechuan peppercorn green Szechuan peppercorn fennel seeds cumin uh, orange peel and bay leaf. Um, so all that goes in, it gets pressure cooked. Um, you can also just braise it until it's like soft. Um, then we take out all the meat, um, reduce down the braising liquid, take out all the spices. And then we add in, uh, mole poblano, which I get locally here as well. Mole, um, comes from Oaxaca in Mexico. Um, at least that's where it's like, that's where Tom is. Um, and it's just also just like a mix of a lot of different like spices, chilies, nuts, etc kind of cooked down forever. You can definitely make your own if you want to, but the best moles are cooked like for days on end. Um, so if you have the time, recommend you doing it, try it out, you know, but if not, you know, you can always buy one. You can always pick up a, a, a little paste. Um, and that's what the sauce is in. Uh, that's what the beef is cooking in right now in that sauce, mole, and then the reduced down braising. Um, we also have uh, a little salsa that I made, and that's basically um, blended pickled daikon and pickled uh, carrots um, that we'll use to top off the, uh, the buns. And so just to like talk about the choice of in- ingredients for a second. Yeah. So like adding the mole to a, to a, a braise for like a, a more, what we might call like traditional like um, bao filling is just, it's like the, oh, your sort of, um, you know, here we are in Sunset Park where mole is readily available. There's like a lot of people here who can, who can relate with it. Yeah. And also it's like, it's adding something to the, to the dish too, in terms of flavor. And, Definitely. Um, and Definitely. then, and then with the pickled carrots and daikon, like when you said that immediately, like I have spent many a time chopping, you know, slicing carrots and daikon for our own family, like pickled salad. Uh, so it's just like these, they seem like small things, but they sort of, 
elicit these really strong emotional reactions of like, um, you know, spending time in the family kitchen and like aromas and smells that are, that are meaningful. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a really interesting choice. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, um, one of my goals in like the food world is, has been trying to bring or like bridge a lot of immigrant communities together. Um, you know, we, I, I think in, in a lot of towns and communities, a lot of these uh, groups are like siloed in their own communities and whatnot, uh, which makes sense. Right. But um, or there's, the, there's this, feeling that they are there's sort a of, feeling yeah of yeah exactly and uh both like culturally and like the way they talk and just like who they hang out with like I, I see that here in Sunset Park at least and one of my goals has always been to try to uh make that bridge uh via food and I it's actually a personal goal of mine because my, my parents uh, are very picky eaters they hate eating like anything not East Asian uh, and sometimes French food um, <laughs> <laughs> and so um like I, I always hated that. And I always thought, well, like there are so many different similarities um, between these different cultures uh, that we can bridge them together and make an eating experience that will hopefully make uh, like different communities kind of connect with that food. Uh, and it could be from different places, but at the end of the day, it's the same dish. And I would love to see just like a, you know, an Asian auntie and like a, like a yeah, Mexican auntie in the same store together, eating the same food and like feeling a certain way about it, mm -hmm. but maybe from a completely different aspect, but feeling mm -hmm. something. Yeah. Uh, that there's, that's also that there's some connection between what's actually in the dish that, that can draw them together. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's also why we grill, we griddle the bowels too, um, to get more of that like taco feeling instead of like that softness, you get a little bit of crunch on the outside. It feels and eats like a, like what taco is, how I always think about this. Um, I always think about those little like tiny tacos that you see on the street, the bowel tacos that are just, taco meat and then and then say right a little salsa uh, so that's the idea here it's like a beef mole with fowls you know a la taco and a little salsa and then eat it like a taco perfect are there other dishes or like ingredients or, or ways of cooking that you, well first of all i think we should talk about my sweet grandma your your um your endeavor here so maybe you should maybe you can give us like just tell us a little bit about yeah, what it is and, for sure um so MSG or MSG Kitchen, um, what we do is mainly pop-up events, uh, kind of mostly in New York, but kind of wherever I find a space to do it. Um, these days, our focus has been more around education and, and history. So what we do is uh, really look at American history um, and take a dive into like immigrant history within America and try to develop dishes either around that those stories, um, whether they're historical based on history or just like inspired by the history. Um, sometimes it's a little easier to like explain by an event that I did. So um, most recently we did an event called Journey to the South. It was an exploration of the American South by way of Chinese migration to the Mississippi Delta, Vietnamese refugees into the Gulf Coast, and also the Black Creole culture in the South. Um, and the whole idea was to create this like Chinese Viet Creole menu. Again, the idea of having communities connect to the food in different ways, mm -hmm. uh, but bring it all together into one one dish or one cohesive menu, mm -hmm. uh, but also use food as a platform to educate our, our patients, our eaters, our diners um, in a way that like maybe they're not, they are used to, they haven't learned these histories before. And in a way that's also like fun and interactive for them. You know, uh, I put a lot of thought behind the food that I make and I try to make sure that everything that goes in um, pays proper homage to like the stories that we're trying to tell, but also like makes people think a little bit more. Uh, about like, hey, this is this is what food can be. Um, this is what like the vehicle of food can be used as, um, and that's kind of like my my mission is mm -hmm. to like spread that wisdom, spread that knowledge, and empower people through that way. Yeah, I feel like that connects a lot to the research that you're doing, Veronica, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you guys in this event. Is you know both of you are really thinking through the way that food is part of history, the way that people's histories are shape how they make food. Yeah. Um, and I think also having us cook here together is so much a part of your method as an archaeologist. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your work, too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, like one of the things that as an archaeologist, we have a lot of access to are the remains of everyday life, which is essentially um, like in the 19th century Chinese migration patterns like cooking. Um, and so, you know, what I so there's a lot of there are a lot of ways that you can look at, you know, the range of ceramic um, styles and patterns and the sources of those things, of the ceramics, in addition, like any other type of material culture, the glass, you know, medicine or, or water, um, soda water, mineral water, 
um, bottles and, and also like actual animal remains, like the cooking remains, like we don't have any bones in this here, but if we were cooking a dish that had bones and we lived in a society where we threw our trash out, you know, in the backyard, then an archeologist could recover it and do a lot of like material work to recover and identify both ingredients and sometimes even like types of dishes that are being cooked. But I've always felt, and, and I think that's really important work to do and, and requires a lot of specialists, but it also requires a sort of understanding, of, especially in historical time periods of like practices of cooking at the time and meanings that are associated with the practice of the cooking at the time. Like it's one thing to identify a cleaver blade at, a, at an archeological site, but what does it actually mean for the person who was holding it? Well, in this, in our case, you know, as, as um, descendants of immig Chinese immigrants, it's, we have people we can talk to about this. And so what I try to do in addition to like, you know, tabulating um, certain patterns and, and um, number of individual specimens of, you know, pork bones or whatever, and what type of bone is being cooked. Um, I like to talk to people uh, and especially as we're cooking together uh, about the things that they find useful to them, uh, like in terms of like actual utensils too. So like we've got long tongs and a spatula and in the kitchen around, I'm saying you've got the long chopsticks and all this stuff, you know? So like the space that we cook in is also sort of informing what we can cook. Like without this large griddle, you wouldn't be able to cook all of these boughs for all of us. Um, and, but also there's a mean, like, like you're saying, like you've been talking about, Sean, there are meanings attached to the food that we eat. And so unless we're actually speaking to people about it, um, it's really, in the case of historical archeology, span when you can actually talk to descendants and people in a community that is, um, uh, that can trace a lineage, uh, it becomes easier to sort of get at these meaningful attachments to dishes and ways of cooking and, and ways of thinking about, you know, because migration is such a, no matter what type of migration, it is such a dis it causes such disjunctures, right? Like there are things we're thinking about the homeland, like the way that my mom had me slice, you know, diagonally and then into thin strips. Like that's something she learned from her mother, and a lot of other people in China also do too. But we don't necessarily talk about it. It's one of those everyday things that just gets um, elided. But it's it's this practice from um, a place that that we have a historical connection to. In the meantime, we find ourselves in these new places with other people who have also come here and have their own historical practices. And so seeing how this all blends together is a really fascinating. And I think, you know, people tend to think of everyday cooking or even special events like what, what Sean's doing as, um, you know, like they tend to look down on cooking, but it's actually this really like this place where we can find a lot of really meaningful um, uh, things about what it means to be in a community all of that so that's a very long-winded explanation of how mm -hmm. you can use archaeology and archaeological methods um, I love that it's yeah. like um, it made me think a lot about um, I think a lot of cooking these days has gone into more of this like systematic uh, approach you know it's very like you go to cooking school or culinary school it's very like the, the teaching section things the teaching you like the brigade system and whatnot and you know you talked about slicing carrots diagonally and then you know slicing thin strips Right, like in, in the French cooking, we call it Julienne, but like, you know, they don't call that in China. They don't call it. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, <laughs> and, and it's really funny how like food techniques and things like that get assigned a certain culture just by way it's like passed down. But mm -hmm. like realistically, there are a lot of different things going on in a lot of different places in the world, right? And it's 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 all relevant. And but now it's just about like who gets that knowledge and like where do we where do we place it? Right? Yeah. And and for me, that's the, the stories, right? The stories are, are why it's so important, what makes it so important. And that's how I place it. Yeah. And I think you've also been doing these sort of cooking with people as a research method. And I think that there's also these things about the practice of cooking that get really overlooked. Like sometimes, Sean, you describe your recipes and you're just like, oh, I just, you know, did this and it's like no big deal. But then we see you cook and we see like, you know, how you griddle these and like how you you know like mix the, the fact that you the fact that you've had to start days earlier on this right, right. but it looks so effortless when it's done and um, and like these are things that kind of you only get to them through the act of cooking together and that like you know there's sort of a benefit to that kind of like in for anthropologists we would call it like participant observation mm -hmm. but like this sort of practice of like being here and doing these things together 
you know, we really get at something else that I think we often miss. Yeah, definitely. Like also like just for an example, the, the Fujian cooking wine, you know, turns out it really means a lot to Sean that yeah. we, we <laughs> use specifically Fujian cooking wine. Um, and like, so that's, those are the sort of things that I'm interested in. It's like, why this one ingredient and not the other? And like in a pinch, would you do it without? And what are those moments of in a pinch, right? And so right. that's uh, definitely, uh, I think, something that you don't get unless you're in the same place doing doing this together. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Should we start putting this together? Yeah, yeah totally good. We can keep talking as we Yeah, go. they look like there's a, there's like a steam coming off of it. <laughs> uh, the other thing about cooking, like researching cooking in particular, um, as an anthropologist is that it's a total sensory endeavor, right? Like when you cook and you eat, that you engage all of your senses. Um, and usually when we write things up, it's really hard to, to get at that. So something like this, where we, we have cameras, I mean, you can't smell it. That's the one day we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we want, and like, that's again, I think what we're saying about being here in person is that some conversations are inf like informed by smells. Um, like I'm just, I'm, right now I'm smelling. <laughs> I'm smelling all of the spices and it's just so well, it's bringing me back like the star anise like I feel like I'm in my mom's kitchen right now and it just makes me feel so comforted and I'm looking at these like it's hard to keep talking because I want to keep them <laughs> can you turn this for the camera yeah. y'all need to be able get to a look see. at this very wet taco it's supposed to be very um very wet very messy hopefully very handheld. We're gonna top it a little bit of chili dress as well, just a little spice. And that one is much more close. Awesome. These look so good. So did you go to culinary school? Though? I did not. I am all self-taught. Uh, yeah, everything I, I learned is uh, from the internet and from observation and from like trial and error. Um, but I think it's really fun because, you know, cooking, cooking is such a fundamental thing. So it's like, the more you do it, the more you just like something clicks in your head. Yeah. Um, and then you like, for me, I, I feel like I'm at the place where I, I can just whip up whatever, whatever because mm -hmm. I, I at least like know how to season. I also know how to fix things. Yeah. Right? That's like the most important part. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. Cheers, y'all. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks. Thank cheers. you for making these. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that brings up like, um, Actually, I was just telling Maya the other day about this dumpling catastrophe I had the other night. Um, we had, uh, mm. my mom and I were growing garlic chives and this is the second year. So they came in, they were beautiful. And in fact, we now have too many garlic chives, <laughs> like Joe Tsai, too much. Um, and so I had taken a huge, a, a lot back to my apartment in Cambridge and was gonna make um, scrambled egg dumplings with um, rice noodles and, and garlic Ooh. chives. I was so excited. I start off the year right. Um, with a batch of frozen dumplings. Um, but it was so late at night when I started rolling out the dough and it was like 85 degrees and I was back in my tiny, tiny kitchen uh, and I, I, I just forgot about the weather. And by the time I had rolled out my first batch of skins and sat down to roll them, like to, to actually make the dumplings, they had all melted back into each other. No. And so I was like, I called my mom. I was like, ah, I gotta throw it all. Like, what a shame. This is so terrible. I'm not like, I'm not fit to be a cook. <laughs> like I can't even make dumplings, um, which my family's from Shen my grandfather's family from Shandong. So it's like very important that we can make dumplings. Um, she, she was like, no, 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 don't throw anything away. You have to like, you can turn these into Bing. And so she walked me through like repurposing the dough, rolling it out. Um, and so luckily crisis averted, but without my mom would not, would not <laughs> would have had like, a total waste of all those garlic chives. Yeah. It's really funny because of like you had someone specifically tell you that, right? And, mm -hmm. and for me, I think a lot of people, so I think a lot of people mm -hmm. like need that. Uh, a lot of people need like someone to like just tell them exactly what it is. Um, but for me, my parents haven't told me anything. They actually like really discouraged me to like, okay, we're, we're like purposely hide things. Uh, but I would always be such a curious person. Like I, I would always just um, take a look and like, see and observe and like try to figure out what it is that we're doing and, and that's how i learned all these like little tricks 
And this, I do the same thing when I'm watching videos, right? Okay. And so I'm like, oh, like, what are they doing with their hands? Like, they're like, not talking about, right? And mm-hmm. there's so much like information that, that can be shared in a non-verbal way. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. How, how are they about that? Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> these are so good. Yeah. And these are better than the last time I had them. Are they? <laughs> and I think that time I had about three. <laughs> well, we have plenty. So <laughs> we also have keeping our staff too. Oh man. <laughs> these are out of this world. Yeah. Yeah. It's but whole, actually of this world. Of like this world. Literally of this place. <laughs> it's really carroty. I love the carrot. Carrot. Yeah, yeah. That's the salsa. The salsa yeah. is very carroty. Yeah. You really get that. It's it's a nice balance for the spice. Which is yeah, it's very different. Oh, I, I forgot to say in the in the sauce we also um I also put like tiny black sugar, like those mm-hmm. bricks. Mm-hmm. Um and that adds like a very specific sweetness to it as well. Wow. These are I'm in love. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> in napkin. Thank you. Yeah. Oh man. I think yeah. it was interesting what you said about like your parents not wanting you, like like actually hiding some some very important things. So I think the just the difference between I've no I'm starting to notice a difference between folks who like children who grew up like with families in restaurants and then fa- like families who didn't do that. Um on the one hand, like when I was first starting to make dumplings, one day my mom just said, make dumpling dough. And, the, and her instructions were like, add water to flour. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then like at that point I had watched her enough. She just assumed that I would know what I was doing. But like, and I was like 12 years old or something. I did not know what I was doing. <laughs> but um, I think that what's really interesting, like in contemporary foods, like Chinese American food studies is that there, there is there's a constantly an unspoken distinction between sort of restaurant food culture um, and in even like Chinese American identity stuff that people talk through about through restaurants and then sort of like um, less attention paid to generally like how we feed ourselves, like our mm-hmm. family, other members of our community. Sometimes that happens in a restaurant space, but sometimes it doesn't happens at, um, you know, family gatherings, weddings, things like that. So I, I'm wondering, like, and in your case, you're sort of saying, like, I wonder if you could speak to, like, you know, what you were saying, they didn't let you cook at home. Yeah. So who did cook at home? Um, my my mom mostly cooked at home when I was with my parents uh, or I was with my grandmother. Um, but a lot of times I actually just ate at the restaurant. So I ate, like, restaurant food or staff meal or whatever. Um, yeah, that's, like, I, I would cook every now and I would try to cook for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember the first time I cooked uh i was making a chorizo fried rice and it was just like greasy mess of, of a fried rice and i was like i don't know about this one uh my parents would actually when i tried cooking at the restaurants uh they were always um they always like really they're like oh man this food's like not good like stop cooking like <laughs> and my sister my, I, I swear uh my older sister is the reason why i like season things well these days um so i have a salty leaning palate so i tend to over i when i was younger i tend to go salt things mm-hmm. my sister always slapped me every time when i would cook for her she always slapped me every time things were too too uh, salty um and so since then <laughs> i always like a little i know the, the amount of salt like that pavlov's uh, training <laughs> right right exactly <laughs> exactly no, totally um yeah it, it makes so what you're saying before about the whole like restaurant versus like home cooking also makes me think about like so the reason why my my parents, my grandmother um, would always say, hey, like, we don't want you to be in restaurants, um, was also was always because of like, economics, mm-hmm. right? It was always about, you know, you're not gonna make a lot of money, you're never gonna see your family, and you have to work, like, ridiculous hours. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, no parent would want that for their child, right? Uh, and I think it makes sense. It's really, you know, when when they see me cooking at home, they actually love now when I'm like, have an interest in like, Fujinese food, my, my grandma's cooking less and less now because she's getting older, but now I'm taking like the mantle of like cooking um, our, our family dishes. Mm-hmm. Um, and she loves that. She loves that I can like cook at home, but she always says, Sean, only, only like stay at home cook, you know, like don't, don't go into the, don't go into the business. Um, and I think a lot of it is, it's a separation of like cultural tradition and like cultural economics, right? And you, you see that difference too. And when you think about like Chinese history, Chinese culture yeah. and, and mm-hmm. migration history and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, when we think about the types of jobs that were available to Chinese, like even still today, the types of jobs that are available to Chinese immigrants, you know, regardless of, of official status or whatever, it's always, it's been service, like after 
labor resource extraction, it's been service. And, yeah. and there are reasons for that. And we're still like, we like there are the legacies of that that we're still dealing with. It happens, you know, you see it in the types of restaurants that are on the street and also in the way that parents, um, you know, the hopes and dreams that they have for their kids and what they, what they want them to do. And yeah, uh, yeah it's definitely, it's difficult to talk about, it's difficult to write about because it's very complicated and nuanced, but I think it's a really important aspect of, um, you know, immigration history, Chinese immigration history in particular, yeah, or as an, as a particular example. Um, it's funny now, now a lot of the Chinese immigrants or like immigrant families, now they're opening up bubble tea shops instead of restaurants. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents also went down that route too. Um, after we closed down our restaurants, we went to like closing liquor bubble tea. Uh, and it's just, it's proven to be so much easier than like running a restaurant. And so I think a lot of, and like just as popular, right? Mm -hmm. um, so like a lot of those folks are going to that now instead. Um, but the renaissance of like Chinese American food um, in New York and in the States is, is also a particularly interesting one, right? Like you're seeing, you're seeing almost a, a movement away from your, your Chinese takeout spot and yeah. into things that are a little bit more like high end, a little like mm -hmm. upper class. Or specialized. Specialized. Um, so I, I think the way that I see it, the way that I've observed it as the, the ones that are very like, we'll say, we'll, we'll, we'll use the word authentic, but I Yeah, I know, we authentic. need a better word. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Someone should do a dissertation about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, the, the ones that are a little bit more like, hey, this could probably exist in China as well. Yeah. Um, those are typically like transplants. Like those are your mm -hmm. Central Mountain House as well, the Central Mountain yeah. House, um, things like that. But then you see things that are more like Chinese American, things like Jinzi um, or like 86 down here. And those are um, kind of like people like our generation try to reclaim yeah. the, the food. Um, and service like a particular type of crowd now, like yeah. their their crowd, um, which is you know it's interesting. I, I think it's like because because it's interesting because it services um, a different community, but also like the the same right. Like when Chinese people came here in the eighteen hundreds, um, they were servicing still like the the richer white folk, right? But um, the food looked like chop suey. The food looked like a of chicken. But now the food looks a little bit like nicer, less greasy. But they're still kind of servicing this like upper middle class, which now is actually a lot of like East Asians too, which is cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, that's that's part of the reason, honestly, why I went to food uh, or why I'm doing food now is actually to go away from that. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to service like other communities, some of these like immigrant communities, and, and do food like that. Um, yeah, I, I have a little chip on my shoulder, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> just just say that much. But I, oh, sorry. I just have one one yeah, last. Yeah. Thing I think would be interesting for us to talk about is to bring it back to like Sunset Park and because you both live around here. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you've noticed through the seasons, you know, difference in fresh produce that's available. Like I know in New York, you can get anything that you possibly could think of somewhere. But because um, I know if Zoe was here, she would want to talk about, you know, like in, yeah. in, in traditional Chinese medicine, thinking and then generally in Chinese food philosophy, food is health, right? So, or it affects your health. So if you eat too much of one thing it can affect you, you physically or vice versa. If you you can take, you can eat more things, soups, especially, and they will help you in other ways. So I'm just wondering, like, you know, as you're, as you're living here in Sunset Park, are you, are you sort of seeing a, a seasonal rotation of things? Um, because what she was, what she is often um, like speaking about is that when you eat seasonally, it helps your body it also adapt to the change of seasons. That's really interesting. I think the most, uh, the most I see is all with the street vendors here, uh, like the street stalls. So um, I especially notice it when it's crab season, because even you see like the, the mm -hmm. buckets of crabs just lining mm -hmm. the avenue. Um, and that's always fun. But in general, I, I, it's really, I think the way that our society is kind of made up right now, it, you can get almost anything at any time. Mm -hmm. uh, which kind of sucks, but it goes away from that like seasonality of it. Uh, but I think I think the seasonality maintains maybe with the knowledge, right? So like having a particularly like cooling soup um, could be nice in, in the summer, or if mm -hmm. you're eating something that's like very heating, then like having a cooling soup like with it is supposed to like um, help your body like regulate itself. I, I would always my grandma always made me cooling tea. Um, every time uh, I have like fried chicken or something like that, right? And and she's like, you need to like your your body needs to like regulate itself. So like use this because you have a lot of like like heating elements right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
yeah, it'll, it'll overstimulate. Yeah. yeah. Like it's just, I think a lot of us probably drink a lot of warm water or, or mm-hmm. hot water. Every morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember it's like, um, when my, uh, parents, when my mom took my dad back to China for the first time, they, you know, it was the 80s and it was the late eighties, early nineties. And they actually brought a mini, fr- like a refrigerator to my grandparents' house. It's the first time, um, anyone in the, the compound that they were living, like, had access to to a refrigerator and so they also brought some coca-cola which my dad drinks every day um or used to and so they plugged in the refrigerator put the coca-cola in my dad is very happy you know extreme culture shock Mm -hmm. uh and then the next morning he wakes up there's no coke in the fridge and my grandfather had taken it out because he was like you cannot drink something so cold this early in the morning not to mention you know that it was soda but um (laughs) (laughs) i just think like these and those like knowing that that happened is a story that the family repeats often it's it's become one of those things that i've internalized of like mm-hmm. i'm not feeling good maybe it's because i'm like i'm not eating well i'm not drinking well like i gotta you know, pour me a glass of hot water <laughs> like what about those like other myths though like like eating like fish eyes will make you see in the dark because I, I definitely grew up with those too i've like, never heard that no? <laughs> no one ever told me that although it was a, you know it was always a, a treat like you would like if you were special you would get mm. the fish eye I never eat the fish eyes, but my grandma would used to tell me um, if I eat scallions, I'd be like 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 a better child. Like why? Right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I eat scallions all the time, and that's why I'm, I'm so that's why I'm her favorite. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a couple of questions already, and you know, for anyone else in the audience, feel free to put questions um, in the chat. Um, Cynthia asks, can you speak to how immigration or forced immigration required immigrants to change what and how they cooked? How did their culture change or evolve depending on where they ended up? And what uh, might this mean to be Chinese, for example, Chinese immigrating to the U.S. versus the U.K. or other locations? And I'll add a little to this because we were talking about this a little bit, the differences between like Chinese food in different places versus like, you know, other kinds of foods that have had a little bit more, we hate the word fusion here, but like a little bit more like integration with other kinds of cuisines. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think immigrants are incredibly resourceful, right? They have to be. Um, and at the most, at the core of it, they just want to keep what they, what they know, right. And, and pass down those things down. I, I, I think, um, I, I know that, like, let's say, for example, I, I think it's a lot of, like, just localized, right? So, like, let's say, like, someone, we want to use a specific Chinese red pepper, but, like, they don't have that here. So, instead, they'll just use, like, whatever red pepper that they have, right? And I think there's there's actually a lot of talk, I feel, to around, like, oh, like, it's so ingenious that they use, like, this instead of that, which it is. But I think oftentimes, like, the truth of it is that they just kind of use whatever they had, right? Like, was so, like, like a there is what you have in your mind about what you'd like to make or like what you think is the right way to make something. And then you're faced with the, the reality of the, of the ingredients and supplies that you have, yeah. which could be ranging from very minimal. You know, if you're like on a, like a, for instance, a railroad work camp, the railroad, like all the supplies have to come in through, mm-hmm. um, you are not yourself carrying all of the supplies. Like there is someone else in charge. So the, the range of options available to you for, of, what you would like to do versus what you would, what you have sort of influences what you can cook. Yeah. Um, it's like beef and broccoli, right? Broccoli isn't like a Chinese ingredient, right? We have a Chinese broccoli, but, um, and there's like a beef with Chinese broccoli, like type of dish in China. Um, but, you know, I, I can imagine that the story is they wanted to order broccoli mm-hmm. and they got these like crowns of American broccoli and we're like, all right, well, I guess we just like cook this like we normally do. And then thus became like even broccoli, right? Yeah. The other thing in particular with Chinese immigration history is that a lot of, a lot of men in particular worked in service of like white Western households um, in addition to also being labor. So whether they like spent some time in Hong Kong, like you see this in the cookbooks, most of the early Chinese American, like uh, Chinese language cookbooks from the 19th century are written for Chinese cooks or chefs in like British households in Hong Kong Mm -hmm. and so and so they like when they came to the U.S. a lot of them already had a lot of knowledge or got jobs in 
um, you know, like white Western household. And so brought a lot, like maybe they, their first experience of broccoli was there. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, oh, well, we know the Amer- like we know the white folks will eat the broccoli. So let's put it in with the beef. And, right. um, yeah. That's how my grandfather got us started, actually. It was, he started in Hong Kong. And then he worked, when he got to the States, he worked at like a steakhouse mm-hmm. uh, first. And that's how he got money first. And like, mm-hmm. he learned. I remember actually recently, because my grandfather's getting like even older, um, he was he was like man i used to like know so many like i used to make a, a great steak and like make amazing like steak sauce and i forget all of it and and so i was talking to him about that but yeah it goes totally with that like they're they're learning certain things mm-hmm. and they're being informed by like you know who they think that they need to cater to mm-hmm. um who they think they need to like what, what they think they need to do to make money and survive and we'll like adjust from there yeah yeah, definitely. Uh, but you're you're talking about before around like just uh, global global like Chinese people. Like, mm-hmm. I, it's really interesting because we're seeing Chinese people are like almost everywhere. I, I think like we're like far like very spread out uh, away from China. A lot of Chinese migration uh, all across the world, um, and I, it's really interesting seeing like the time periods, right? So you can really place the cuisine based off like the time periods in which they like came. So anything that's like more typical of like a Chinese takeout spot, you know that that's like old Chinese. Um, but anything that's new, like Sichuan joints or things like that, it's like more recent, more like more Shanghainese places or like things like that are specialized. That's very recent uh, Chinese Chinese migration, which I think is like super fascinating. Um, another person is asking you to walk through the recipe for the bao dough and how you prepared it for grilling instead of steaming or baking it. So these baos, they're totally store bought. You can totally make your own. Um, but what I would say is if you are making your own, you steam them first and then griddle them. So these, if you just buy them, if you buy them from the pack, they're already like baked up, right? And you're steaming them to heat them up. Same thing, we're just putting them on the griddle um, to heat them up. And the thing I like about griddling these bows is that the center stays like nice and soft, but the outside is, is a little crispy, adds that texture to it. Um, you don't need to add water. You don't need to do anything. It's just a little bit of fat onto the, skid- uh, onto the griddle or like skillet or whatever. Uh, and just wait till they get brown. If you wait till they get brown like this on both sides, um, then you can open them up and they're nice and pillowy on the inside because they, they steam like that. And then you just fill them. It's like super simple. You can buy, you know, bags of 10 bows uh, from the freezer section of your local Asian food market and just put them on a, on a skillet. Um, but if you're making a bow, yeah, you know, make follow your traditional bow recipe. Um, I know that for the folds, what they like to do is um, they'll like put a little bit of oil and then they'll put a chopstick in there and then fold it like that and then slip the chopstick out and that's how they make the folds. You have to like let it rise a few times and then you steam them and then let them cool, put them in the freezer um, and then and they'll keep it. They'll keep for a while. I've made plenty, plenty of bows. <laughs> actually, a fun thing with bows is that you can actually like flavor them too. So I remember one of the original bows that I made uh, when I was making bows to start to finish, uh, I flavored mine with black garlic. Uh, on our website, actually, I think there's a recipe. There might be a recipe for that, uh, like not your grandma's bow. Um, it's like a traditional like, kind of pork belly bow, which also fun fact, um, I grew up eating like Monto, like this, like mm-hmm. steamed bun, buns with pork belly, but as two separate dishes, right? Mm-hmm. And a lot of times the guava is associated with like Taiwanese food, uh, which it is, right? I think that guava is like Taiwanese, but um, I basically had that dish, but with this Monto and then you would cook pork belly with pickled mustard greens and then make our own little like sandwiches and eat it like that. So I always associate with Fujian food, but now yeah. I'm coming to learn that it's, it's Taiwanese and accepting that. Well, I mean, I think that's the interesting thing, right? Is like how, how specific, like when, uh, this is another thing that interests, I think a lot of other food scholars of like, what, what do you call a di- like how spe- specific does a location have to be you know and the thing is like certain types of like certain things about cooking are just universal right like a, a, um a, a bow is a, you can think conceptualize of it as a bun and like you, i don't know I, it, this is this gets into like who gets to decide yeah. what mm-hmm. a, like what a special food is and i like, getting into like talk like just talking about the un and things like that <laughs> <laughs> um i think Sure, we can spend a whole other hour yeah, a question for, for other people. <laughs> um, someone else has a question on this sort of topic. Yeah. Says, speaking of bao, it's very interesting to see that Japanese style ramen restaurants here in the U.S. have pork belly buns as a side menu, which yeah. is not common in Japan. Um, it's said that Korean American David Chang of Momofuku started to serve them in 2004, and now there are expectations among customers here that ramen restaurants should have buns that look originally from China, Taiwan. 
what do you think about such a fusion of various Asian cuisines? Um, I have, you know, feelings about David Chang. Um, <laughs> they're, they're mixed feelings, you know, they're all bad or good. Um, I actually, like, I, I think David Chang is a great model uh, from a business perspective. He, like, created such a great empire and has such an influence on it. Um, but I think him, like many uh, other chefs, um, are still catering to, like, a specific type of audience, right? And like it shows in their, in their upbringing, it shows like how they were raised, it also shows in the way they present themselves. That's really fun. Um, you know, we all have, this goes back to the idea of like authenticity, right? If this is authentic to him and to his experience, then it's authentic, right? Um, I think it's really funny. I'm glad that they know that history that like, yeah, David Chang is the reason why like ramen shops have um, pork buns uh, now ubiquitously, which is like really funny to see. But it's also like, you know, they call the pork in like ramen trashu, which is mm-hmm. like Chinese pork too. Mm-hmm. So there's like, there is a connection that ramen is like Chinese, a Chinese noodle, right? So I, I, I think like the, the question is really like how I feel about it, right? Um, and honestly, at this point, you know, I think there's an evolution of food that like goes into it. And I, I truthfully think that a lot of times, honestly, East Asian people are like, we act too much as gatekeepers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's, it's fair, right? Like we, food is so quintessential to our culture to like how we perceive our density too um but it it sometimes can be limited right i think a lot about um and i'm trying to defend the the dude who um from like boat app or the dude who has like a restaurant called i think it's called like broth or something like way back who like was on a bone app uh video talking about pho right and saying like oh this is the way that you should eat it blah 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 and then uh, I remember, like, you know, the internet going up in flames for that, and I, I, me, I was just like, well, like, he's not, he's not really saying anything wrong, right? Like, yeah, like, when I go to a photo restaurant, like, what I do to test if the photo is good, I drink the soup first, and then, like, see how I feel about it, and then, like, I'll add all my stuff because I know, like, what I like it, how I like it, um, but, yeah, I think, like, a lot of people get reaction, right? and, and for, you know, for good reason, and it really helps people, like, stay honest and hold people accountable, but, like, it, it, when you go too far into it, then you get people that are like saying that you can't make any other food besides your own, which I think is, it's so like, it's pigeonholing yourself. There's mm-hmm. no room for this, like this fusion. There's no room well, for I, evolution. Yeah. I think it also doesn't recognize the fact that like here in places where there is a lot of immigration, that's not your experience, right? You like your own physical day-to-day experience is not one of being siloed. Um, mm-hmm you have the opportunity to, to like enge- engage with other things. And so to just be like, okay, I'm only going to be this one thing forever and not, and not engage with the people around me and the things that they like and, and, and actually like learn and live with it. I, I think it's a, it's a mentality that can be um, limiting yeah. and doesn't reflect the reality of like the fact that we have had decades, you know, decades and well, I, I'm an archaeologist, so you can go back like, you know, <laughs> however many thousands of years you want to go back into the patterns of migration that, yeah. that we as a species like, like go through and you can tr- like spice, you can go back to like the spice trades and all of this stuff. Like this is all very ingrained in, in um, we're all constantly taking in new, new experiences, new ingredients and, and thinking like, do I want to incorporate this into my life or not? Um, it happens through many different ways, like through an appropriation or just like, a, this is what's available to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and that navigating that line of being like, this is what's available to me. So I'm going to create something out of it versus these more commercial forms of fusion. I, I think that's actually the, where this discussion gets. Some people are talking about one thing. Other people are talking about the other thing. Yeah. And, but it's the same word. And so <laughs> yeah. it causes all this confusion. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Totally. yeah. Like I spend a lot of time thinking about Indian Chinese food, which is like Chinese food that has been adapted for Indian taste to be like very spicy. It, it doesn't really resemble what I think of when I think of even spicy Chinese food. It's not like Sichuan food. It's like it's a whole different thing, spice to an Indian palate. And like, I don't know that we would call that fusion. It is a kind of like sort of migration history or like a food migration history Mm -hmm. and I think we have a lot of similar cultures I mean probably a lot of the Caribbean has similar um yeah Yeah. there's a lot of these sort of fusion moments or something like that and also even in the U.S. you know like as we've been thinking about what it means to be an 
Asian neighborhood or like, you know, Asian people from lots of parts of the world, like come to Chinatown and like have restaurants there because it's a place that people imagine to be yeah. like amenable to people that look like us. Yeah. All the varieties of what that can mean. <laughs> Non-white. <laughs> and so you get, you get all these like sort of mixes and inspirations of different immigrants. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was being glib, but like, it's always Chinatown as a conception, of, yeah. uh, as a place where the people who are different can be, can live, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a really important phenomenon and American, in American history specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, for sure. So, um, we are at 1 p.m., I think. Oh, okay. oh wow. So, time went by see when you're coming (laughs) together and talking together the time just flies yeah thank you so much for tuning in um as i said we're back october 3rd um 6 30 p.m if you're on live stream or if you want to join us at beer wax brooklyn um that the doors should be at 6 p.m i think um we would love to have you join us for our next conversation which will be um on it's called uh, it's called Brooklyn to Beijing Black People Black Culture in China and it's featuring Dr. Zifeng Liu, uh, Jackery Bohan Phoenix and MC Tingdong. So hope you can join us and thanks for tuning in today. Thanks everyone.